Hello everyone and welcome back to Bitwig Studio and Music Production. This is lesson 5.17 and in this lesson I just want to talk about FM again just a little bit because I rewatched the last video and realized that I might have gone a little bit too fast, got a little too ahead of myself and the underlying concept may have been lost on some of you. So if you watched the last video and totally got it or you're already an expert at FM synthesis, there's no reason to watch this video, but I think it might be helpful to some of you who are still scratching your head a little bit. And by the end of this video, I hope that you can understand why FM synthesis is so useful for something like the hit section on the E hat, why it's also very useful for something like a growl bass. That's now where FM synthesis is kind of always referred to as we think of the Skrillex growl basses. And then also why it could be used to emulate acoustic instruments and why exactly it can be more usable than, say, subtractive synthesis, which we've already covered and is really straightforward. So I'm going to start this conversation by talking about the two different types of oscillators in audio applications, at least. So we have audible oscillators and we have inaudible oscillators. Audible oscillators are anything that um, cycle is faster than approximately 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. All right, so once we reach that threshold of 20 to 20, we usually can hear it. And that's really important because we have another type of oscillator, that's the low frequency oscillator. And in most applications, those are going to be inaudible. There's a reason why when I pull up, I'll actually pull up both for you real quick. When I pull up the test tone, the frequency range, in this case, will start all the way down at 8.18, but we're not going to be able to hear that. We can see something's happening, but we can't hear it. And I can go all the way up then from 20 hertz up to over 20,000 hertz. And again, if we turn this on, we're not going to be able to hear it. So in the case of the low frequency oscillator, it stays below the range of human hearing. So it's never going to go above 20 kilohertz. It's going to stay from, and we can even open it up here. In the case of this LFO, we can go from 0.01 hertz up to, I believe, 50 or so hertz. Now, right away, you're probably noticing something, and that's that this LFO is able to go over that 20K, right? Once we start getting up over that, we're becoming now an audible oscillator. Now, by itself, we're not just going to be able to hear this. It doesn't work like that. But whenever you use an LFO and you control anything with it, many of you guys have probably heard this. When you start to go up higher, you start to hear something change. It actually starts to add some harmonics. That oscillator that wasn't supposed to make any sound begins to. And we can do, you know, a real basic example of that. If I even just modulate the gain here, let's put the frequency to something in the middle. So if I modulate this gain, eventually when we start to breach that threshold of 20, this is no longer that frequency. It's no longer sweeping the frequency. It's actually adding something on here. It's becoming audible. It's going that fast. Right? So FM actually kind of utilizes this principle, not exactly like this, and we're going to talk about it more as we progress. But basically, imagine that instead of modulating something like the gain, it's actually modulating frequency. So we have frequency modulating frequency. And in this case, we can go up to 50.1. Let's just put this in exactly at 50. We'll put the test tone back in here, and, and I'll also add on the span in a second. I'm sure you guys all love hearing that test tone. Let's also add the span on here just for fun. And we'll see that if I play this back here, we have our fundamental down here around 200 and we're getting a few overtones and that has to do with the fact that in the real world, there's no such thing as a perfect sine tone. Even with your analog synthesizers, if you just try to play the sine, you're going to see some additional peaks in the frequency spectrum. We could put a filter on here, but for now, let's not worry about it. And we're going to 
do what we did before, only this time we're going to modulate the frequency. Okay, so I can increase this. Right now, you're just going to see these peaks moving across. We're not adding any harmonics here. And actually, we've applied too much. As I start to speed up, though, something is going to change. We are going to start to see new peaks, and we can already see that here. This is no longer just moving the pitch back and forth. We've actually added all of this information to the frequency spectrum. And we can make this even go faster if we go in time and beat. Put this down to 60 fourths and then increase the tempo. So a 60 fourth note at 200 is gonna be faster than a 60 fourth note at 100. So that's honestly the basis of FM synthesis at its core. Now you can tell from doing that that it's not easily controllable, or at least the way we did that example, it's not easily controlled. And for most people, when the DX7 first came out, really a handful of people knew how to program that thing and everybody else was completely lost in the dark because it's a very complicated and difficult synth to program. With time, we've been very lucky and we're up to a point now with uh, the FM synthesizers that they're very easy to program and very easy to understand. And when we think about FM synthesis, if you read even just the Wikipedia page, one of the first sentences is going to say something about adding grit by adding additional harmonics. And what we saw there with the span was we started with that one fundamental. We had a couple of overtones there at their logical places. And then as we started to increase that frequency modulation, we started to see new overtones pop up. We started to deepen and darken and add complexity to that frequency spectrum. And there can be order to it, or there can be chaos to it. And that's kind of the beauty of FM synthesis. So if we pull back up the E hat here on the instrument track, we're gonna see that there's not a whole lot of logic to this. We're just kind of picking at random in terms of number. But the relationship where the FM is occurring is occurring from this frequency to the frequency that we have here. And one very easy way to know that we're doing something consonant is to go back and talk about the ratios that we talked about a long time ago in the harmonics video. And I'd encourage you to go back and maybe review that quickly because if you can understand that, FM synthesis is going to be a breeze for you. And it's really just as simple a concept as uh, subtractive synthesis. It just takes a little bit longer and the results aren't always going to be immediately what you expect them to be. So for example, we can make the simplest ratio of all if I go down here to 2.64 and half of 2.64, or we can even put this in here at 2.64, why not? And now if I play this back, we're evoking that one-to-one -one relationship. You can hear that like so, it's consonant, it's the same note. You can hear we're hyping that particular frequency. You can widen out. Now I could also use different ratios of this fundamental here of 264. I could have that and that would be what? 1.32, so 1320. And I could play it back again. Again, very, very consonant. And when it comes to, for example, the hit of a drumstick hitting a hat, it's not going to be super consonant. It's not always going to be logical. When we think of drum sounds, they're not really tonal sounds. They're not pitched. They're noise. They're different types of timbres you evoke. You're not trying to evoke particular pitches. In this case, I can do that because I know the mathematics involved. And if I want something super consonant, I can come up with something super consonant. But if I want something very dissonant, how am I going to evoke that? Well, it comes back to that harmonic series and the underlying concept that 
the more, or excuse me, the simpler the ratio, the more consonant. So we have one to one, two to one, three to two, four to three, perfect fifth, perfect fourth, major third, minor third, five to four, six to five, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When we start to get up to things like 221 to 220, that's not simple anymore. It's incredibly dissonant. And when we're using FM synthesis, and we'll see this with the FM4, and we're going to talk about in really great depth, we'll understand how we can use both consonants and logic and how we spring up new overtones and how we do some dissonant stuff. So right now, if I pull the span on here, we can see those overtones evoked. And we can pull this back to 2640. Look at just how simple that is compared to what we just saw. It's going to get really complicated when we go just a little bit away from this. All right, that's going to be the most complicated and most difficult ratio. So if I just shift and pull this up a little bit, now take a listen and take a look. Got to go actually a little bit further, don't I? So we're seeing all these new overtones and that's a real nasty one. And that's really playing off of this initial frequency and where this is falling. And this is of course the percentage of FM we're evoking. And for a drum hit or something like this, it's perfect. We don't want to be able to control those numbers because we don't really care if it's pitched or not because a drum hit typically isn't pitched. It's typically super busy up here in the harmonic spectrum. And that's where FM synthesis really began in a lot of ways, is if you study the frequency spectrum of any sort of instrument, you, in theory, can reproduce that using FM based on the um, relationships you're going to build, based on how much you're going to run one oscillator into another oscillator. At that point, they become operators. And that's really the basis of FM synthesis. And we can see that, for example, if we want a growl bass, if we want a growl bass line, we're probably going to want to keep some ratios relatively simple and, you know, maybe at that two to one, three to two sort of range. But to get all those extra nasty overtones at the top, we might also evoke something completely random, like a 1.3275 in the ratio field. And we'll talk about this with the FM4, and that's going to add all sorts of crazy random harmonics. And when you think about a growl bass, it is so full in the frequency spectrum that of course it makes sense to use FM synthesis to try to get that sort of a result. So that's why people use FM for growls, but it's the same reason why they'll use it for something like a string instrument. If you see a string instrument, you really study its frequency spectrum and you have a pretty good understanding of FM synthesis with some time and with some patience, you can dial in settings to attempt to replicate that. And if you go through some of the presets on the FM4, you'll see how Bitwig has tried to do it. Uh, some better than others. If you use, for example, FM8 by Native Instruments, probably like the most well-known FM synthesizer out there, some of those presets are pretty spot on. And the DX7 was well known for being able to uh, get pretty close to a lot of instruments. And that was its original application. It was so they didn't need studio band members at all times. Somebody could just, you know, instantly have a string or instantly have a piano. It took a long time for people to start experimenting and trying to program it themselves. And um, obviously today, you know, people use FM synthesis for all sorts of things, if that's, if that's what's called for, if they need to try to evoke certain things in that frequency spectrum. So I hope this has made sense to you guys. I wanted to try to clear things up. I got a little too excited in the last video. And when we get to the FM4, we're going to spend a lot of time trying to go through it and trying to understand all of these things. So look forward to that. I hope this was helpful. Take care.